Well, hello, AP Calc AB friends. Let's take a look at a pair of examples from our 6.3 lesson. I know the 6.3 lesson's starting to kind of get a rather long here, but we are getting very close to the end of it. And the good thing is, is we're done with all of those really long, rigorous examples. We're now able to kind of focus on a new way to think about area under a curve, a new way to write it from a notation standpoint, and we're just on the verge of finding a really cool shortcut. So let's take a look at our examples 10 and 11, using a definite interval to depict area. So what do we have here? Well, we got a problem that says to set up a definite integral that would calculate the area of each region below. And so we just started to talk a little bit about what a definite integral is at the conclusion of example 9. Now, we just really briefly touched the surface of it. So basically, those two words together mean integral is this symbol right here, and definite means boundaries on it, a lower end and an upper end. That is the symbol that's now put in front of your function that you're finding the area under. And then this dx here is just part of the package. Because what I hope that you understand is that the dx, which is just the change in x, is operating kind of like the width and the f of x is going to act kind of like the height. Now we're going to talk a lot more about that later, so don't worry if that's a little fuzzy at this particular stage because we still are in this development mode. But all I want you to do for problems like number 10 is to figure out what is the function that would be the very top of the shaded region. That's going to be your f of x. So if you look at problem A here, which has this rectangular uh, section here shaded. The top of it would consist of all of this piece here, and I'm going to use a different color so that you can see it better. So this purple pen is, sina, is kind of highlighting what that top function is, and, and technically it would continue to go on forever in both directions. And it's our hope that you see that that is a horizontal line, of course you guys know that's a horizontal line, with the equation y equal 3. Or you could think of it as f of x equal 3, because y and f of x, they've always been the same thing for, you know, who knows how long, right? So now you know that this problem is all about you finding the integral of f of x, which is just 3. Now, as I said before, this dx that looks like it doesn't do much, I want you to plop that in there. That's going to become more increasingly important. And then for the boundaries, you just go to the very far left here and tell me what x value that is. And you know what I want to do, you guys? I'm going to drop this down a little bit lower so it doesn't get interfered with that 0. <laughs> so then that 0 is the lower boundary. And then if we go over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this is a 5, right? That would be the upper boundary. And you're done. That's all you have to do. Final answer. Now notice the directions. If we read them again, it doesn't say that you have to find the area. It just says set up the definite integral that would calculate the area. So that's a, a break. Not like the area would be hard to find anyway. What, 5 by 3 rectangle? The answer is 15. But we're going to develop other ways that you can find this answer in the days to come, and it doesn't involve that limit summation stuff anymore. All right, let's take a look at part B. In part B, we have a triangle shape, and if we think about what comprises the top of this function, it would be these two lines, I guess, right? This upside down V-shaped graph. All right, so now this one's going to be a little bit tougher to figure out what the function is. My hope is that you know that the V-shaped graphs are characterized by absolute values. So, absolute value of what? Well, normally the absolute value of x, which would be located like right here, is our parent graph. But because that V is inverted and flipped upside down, we should know that there's a negative sign in front. 
So our function is negative absolute value of x to flip this upside down. But then we also realize that this v, after it was flipped upside down, has also been shifted up. How many units up? One, two, let's count this again. One, two, three, four units up. So you would add a four after the negative absolute value of x. And that is going to be the sketch of that upside down v. A lot of that comes from your college algebra days or pre-calc days. Now, I like to put any term that's got more than one uh, piece to it, any polynomial that's got more than one term to it in parentheses so that I can put my dx after it and then my integration in front of it. And then when you look here, you see that we have a 1, 2, 3, negative 4 as the lower boundary. And then 1, 2, 3, yep, it should be the same, right? Symmetric, just with an opposite sign. So positive 4 is the upper boundary. And that would be a possible answer for this problem. Now, note I say that would be a possible answer because I would accept another approach to this, not to confuse anyone, but maybe some of you don't see the absolute value graph. Maybe you see two different lines, and that would be okay. This line right here is really the equation y equal 1x plus 4. y-intercept is 4, slope is 1, right? And this line right here is y equal negative x plus 4. y-intercept of 4, slope of negative 1. So one could set this up as two separate integrals. The first one would be x plus 4 with a dx, and you would go from negative 4 to 0. And then you would just simply add an integral of the other line, dx, and start at 0 and end at positive 4. You just have to make sure you remember to put the plus between them. So I want you to understand that these two definite integrals, or these two expressions, would be equivalent. They would give you the area of this orange region, which is, uh, I think, 1 half times 8 times 4. I think 16 is this actual area. But that, again, was not the point of the problem. It's just the setup. Okay? Let's take a look at number 11 here. I want to do two examples uh, in this particular video because they're so, so similar. This is basically backwards. In this particular case, I want you to sketch and shade the region whose area is given by the definite integral. And then it does say to use geometry to actually find the area. So for part A, we see that our function is f of x equal 2x plus 5. We should recognize that as a line where the y-intercept is positive 5. And the slope being 2 means we would normally go up 2 units and over 1 unit, but we can't really do that due to our space constraints. So we'll kind of cheat and go down 2 units, left 1 unit, something like that. But I don't think that you want to graph this entire line because if you pay attention to the boundaries, we only really are going to go from negative 2 to 0 along the x-axis. So that means we'll start here and just connect the dots until we reach that point. You, in essence, can get rid of those points. Now we are finding the area below the curve, always above the x-axis, and then between negative 2 and 0. So right now, you have yourself what looks to be a trapezoid. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's the shaded region that this definite integral depicts. And the actual area would be, well, we can just use our formula 1 half times the sum of the bases. That base is 1. That base is 5. Maybe you remember this from the trapezoid rule days from the previous topic. And then the height here would sit along its bottom, which is 2. And so when you multiply those together, the twos cancel, and you get six for the area. Okay? Let's take a look at part B. This one tends to bother kids. And it's because we very often forget what the sketch of y equal square root of 9 minus x squared is. Or f of x equals the square root of 9 minus x squared. Right? There it is. It's just right, right there. So what is this sketch? I would like you to investigate it a little bit, maybe try to t-chart, 
you know, and it's okay if you let x be 0. Hopefully you would see that the y value is 3. If you try to let x equal 1, or if you let x equal 2, things aren't good because you got square root of 8 and square root of 5. But if you let x equal 3, you're going to get 0. And if you let x equal negative 3, you're going to get 0. Now, don't think for a minute that this is an upside down v, because it's not. What you have here is a semicircle. You want to get used to that idea, and part of the reason why this is a semicircle is if you were to have squared both sides, let's say if you took this equation like this and squared both sides, it would result in x squared plus y squared equal 9, which is a full circle with a radius of 3 centered at 0, 0. Now because in the process of solving for this y, square rooting both sides did not bring about the plus or minus. In other words, you don't see the plus or minus here. We only see the plus, and that's why we have the top half. Basically, bottom line, if you see functions written like this, just know that they're semicircles centered at the origin, and the radius is always going to be the square root of that number. And that number is typically going to be 9, 16, 25. So you're going to be finding the area under this curve. Let me see if I can make this a little bit more accurate like that and then let's pick a pick a different color here let's go with the green and this is the shaded region I didn't draw in the x-axis to denote that we're finding the area above it but that's kind of part of the deal so what you need to do here is know what is the formula for the area of a semicircle and that would be one half times pi times the radius squared, which in this case is 3. And so this would be 9 over 2 pi. And there's your area. Last one, you guys, part C. You'll notice that this is a little bit like part B from example 10. You need to know what the parent function absolute value of x looks like. Hopefully we know. That's this guy right here. Vertex at 0, 0, slope of 1, slope of negative 1. What happens in this problem is that minus sign flips the v upside down, and the plus 1 there shifts the v up one unit. Be careful here. You have a scale change that says each block is a half a unit. So this is what this graph would look like. Now note that would continue forever but negative one and one are gonna be my boundaries. So that's why I only wanted you guys to draw that much of the upside down V. You can throw in your X axis if you'd like, and now you're all set to color in. So this is what your shaded region looks like. It is just a triangle. It's just an isosceles triangle. And so now we can return to the area portion, and we just use our formula for the area of a triangle. One half times the base times the height. Be careful, this base looks like four blocks, but it's only two units because of the scale change, negative one to one. And likewise, the height is just one unit. And when you multiply that, your answer is one. So those are your three answers to the areas. Of course, they're accompanied by the graphs. Every video that we show you just gets you closer and closer to this idea of what the definite interval computes, what it means, and then once you fully understand that, that is when I want to start teaching you how to take the definite integral so that you can do a variety of things in calculus. You guys are doing a great job. We only have one more video for this ninth, uh, our topic 6.3 series before we move on. As always, thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.